In addition to the detention of persons apprehended on the battlefield in Afghanistan, President George W. Bush signed a military order on November 13, 2001, stating that terror suspects could be detained within or outside the United States and tried by military commission. In response to the Rasul and Hamdi cases, Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz adopted procedures for the hearings required by those cases. The hearings were to be conducted by special tribunals composed of three commissioned military officers. In 2005, in the Detainee Treatment Act, DTA, Congress curtailed the scope of appellate review of decisions of those tribunals, lodging exclusive jurisdiction in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, limiting the scope of review, and restricting habeas corpus petitions to this review by the D.C. Circuit. These procedures were challenged by Salim Ahmed Hamdan, a Yemeni national who had served as Osama bin Laden's personal driver and who had been in custody at Guantanamo since 2001. Hamdan claimed he was not involved with al-Qaeda and only worked as bin Laden's driver because he needed the money. He was captured in Afghanistan on November 24, 2001 while driving with four other alleged al-Qaeda members, including Osama bin Laden's son-in-law, after a firefight with Afghan forces. In 2003, Hamdan was charged with one count of conspiracy to commit offenses triable by military commission. There was no allegation that Hamdan had command responsibilities, played a leadership role, or participated in planning any terrorist activities. Hamdan filed a petition for a writ of habeas corpus challenging the procedures under the November 13, 2000 military order and the DTA. He argued that the military tribunal should be governed by the Uniform Code of Military Justice, UCMJ, which establishes the procedures for courts martial, that the crime of conspiracy is not a crime of war chargeable under the UCMJ, and that the procedural rules established in the DTA violated military and international law. In a portion of the opinion not included in the casebook, the court first determined that the DTA did not deprive it of jurisdiction to hear Hamdan's appeal because the DTA did not retroactively cover pending cases. The question whether Congress could preclude Supreme Court appellate jurisdiction over some class of habeas corpus petitions, the court suggested, was unclear, but as a matter of statutory construction under the DTA did not need to be addressed. The majority noted that exigency alone will not justify the establishment and use of penal tribunals not contemplated by Article 1, Section 8 and Article 3, Section 1 of the Constitution unless some other part of that document authorizes a response to the felt need. Neither the AUMF nor the DTA, the majority argued, changed any of these fundamental principles. War powers are divided in the Constitution between the executive and legislative branches. The provisions of the UCMJ for military courts had been in effect since World War I and reflected an understanding of the inherent presidential power to convene military commissions. The majority further held that the procedures under the DTA did not satisfy the Geneva Conventions and other laws of nations incorporated into the UCMJ. A key omission, the proceedings can be closed so that the accused or his civilian counsel cannot see the evidence presented. Justice Stevens was also concerned that the evidentiary standard would allow hearsay, evidence obtained through coercion and non-sworn live testimony or affidavits. Article 36 states that ordinary criminal evidentiary rules should be applied in military tribunals so long as they are practicable, and there was no reason, Justice Stevens argued, why they would be impracticable in these cases. A plurality including Justices Stevens, Souter, Ginsburg, and Breyer further argued that there was no precedent in the common law of military commissions for charging an individual with conspiracy apart from overt acts in violation of the law of war. Why was this issue so important to the plurality? Think about the possible scope of a conspiracy charge without specific overt acts in a theater of war. Potentially any civilian who does not actively resist could be considered a co-conspirator just for going to work and supporting the economy of a hostile power. Justice Kennedy, who voted with the majority on the basic issue of procedure, argued that the issue of the conspiracy charge and the Geneva Conventions should not have been addressed. In a dissent, Justice Thomas, joined in part by Justices Scalia and Alito, argued that the procedures adopted by the President fell under Youngstown Category 1 because the AOMF authorized the President's actions. 
Further, just as Thomas stated, the common law of war is flexible and evolutionary and needs to be adapted to a war on terror. The majority misread discretion given to the President under Article 36 of the UCMJ. And even if the Geneva Conventions were judicially enforceable, just as Thomas said, Hamdan has been afforded all the judicial guarantees which are recognized as indispensable by civilized peoples under the circumstances. In a separate dissent joined by Justices Scalia and Thomas, Justice Alito argued that the DTA system features formal trial procedures, multiple levels of administrative review, and the opportunity for review by the United States Court of Appeals and by this court, and therefore it was not merely summary justice. Congress responded to the Supreme Court's ruling in Hamdan by adopting the Military Commissions Act of 2006, MCA, which amended the DTA. This statute contained detailed procedural and substantive provisions for the trial of enemy combatants by military commissions. It also included the following provision regarding habeas corpus. No court, justice, or judge shall have jurisdiction to hear or consider an application for a writ of habeas corpus filed by or on behalf of an alien detained by the United States who has been determined by the United States to have been properly detained as an enemy combatant or is awaiting such determination. And that no court, justice, or judge shall have jurisdiction to hear or consider any other action against the United States or its agents relating to any aspect of the detention, transfer, treatment, trial, or conditions of confinement of an alien who is or was detained by the United States and has been determined by the United States to have been properly detained as an enemy combatant or is awaiting such determination. The MCA further stated that these provisions would apply retroactively to all pending cases. Recall that in Rasul v. Bush, the court had held that a district court has jurisdiction to hear a habeas petition from a person held at the U.S. base at Guantanamo Bay under the existing federal habeas statute. The Rasul court, however, did not decide whether as a constitutional matter the suspension clause applied to aliens detained abroad. Recall that the suspension clause in Article 1, Section 9, Clause 2 states that the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless, when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. In Boumediene v. Bush, the court held that the suspension clause did apply to alien enemy combatants held at Guantanamo Bay and that the MCA violated the suspension clause. Justice Kennedy wrote the majority opinion joined by the liberal bloc. Justice Kennedy first examined whether the suspension clause applies to aliens detained abroad. He stated that such questions of extraterritoriality turn on objective factors and practical concerns, not formalism. Applying what he deemed factors from Einstrager, he noted that petitioners deny they are combatants. The process so far afforded them has been very limited. In every practical sense, Guantanamo is not abroad. It is well within the constant jurisdiction of the United States. There are no substantial costs or dangers involved in habeas proceedings here. He therefore concluded that the suspension clause has full effect at Guantanamo Bay. He then considered whether in the MCA Congress had provided adequate alternative procedures to habeas corpus, and his answer was no. In his view, the MCA provided inadequate judicial review, in particular because it did not afford the accused an opportunity to present new exculpatory evidence not made part of the record in earlier proceedings. He also concluded that even though the executive and legislative branches wanted to preclude access to habeas by alien combatants at Guantanamo, the court's intervention did not violate separation of powers principles. In fact, he concluded, Within the Constitution's separation of power structure, few exercises of judicial power are as legitimate or as necessary as the responsibility to hear challenges to the authority of the executive to imprison a person. This latter point also was emphasized in a concurrence by Justice Souter, who noted that some of the detainees had been imprisoned at Guantanamo for six years without a hearing. In a dissent joined by Justices Scalia, Thomas, and Alito, Justice Roberts argued that the DTA framework provides the combatants held at Guantanamo greater procedural protections than have ever been afforded alleged enemy detainees, whether citizens or aliens, in our national history. 
In a dissent joined by Justices Roberts, Thomas, and Alito, Justice Scalia said that the suspension clause does not apply because the writ of habeas corpus simply does not run in favor of aliens abroad, and that Einstrager authorized the president's actions and did not create any kind of functional test for evaluating cases such as this one. For Justice Scalia, the majority's opinion was based neither on the meaning of the suspension clause nor the principles of our precedents, but rather on an inflated notion of judicial supremacy. As the dissents pointed out, the detention cases raised challenging questions about the interplay between the three branches of the federal government. As note one in the casebook observes, three times the president's new detention and trial procedures went before the court, and three times the court invalidated them even after Congress expressly sought to confer its approval upon some aspects of those procedures. Your view about whether this was a good thing likely will depend on how you understand the court's role in relation to the other two branches when basic constitutional values are at stake. The question of judicial review and the meaning of Marbury v. Madison, which we discussed at the very start of the semester, continues to loom large.